into the Christmas season, did you know that a lot of people get bottomed out? I mean, they just get rock bottom. They get so weary, so frazzled from just so many obligations, running here and running there with family events and so many different obligations. It's very easy to, to get overwhelmed this time of year. By the way, in case you're worried, um, Walmart had the Christmas decorations up first part of October. I mean, <laughs> but that is the truth. In the, in the lawn and garden section, it was October 1, and there were Christmas decorations. <laughs> I quite prefer that to Halloween, but um, I, I mean, uh, the merchants of our world, they don't miss a beat. So, But this, this series that I'm going to be doing called Rest for the Weary is all, is all about finding a place of rest all through the holiday seasons and truly enjoying the holidays as holy days, which is what the word holiday means. So I, I'm just proclaiming that over our church family, holidays that are holy. Well, the message this morning is titled Grit, and I encourage you to open your Bible and follow along at different junctures, or take your device if you want to follow along that way. And um, as we study the life of a man that was gripped by the Spirit of the Lord. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of the Bible character Manoah. Okay, not very many of us, and I don't think I would know the answer to that question if I didn't cheat. How many of you have heard of his son, Samson? Raise your hand. Okay. So we're, we're going to talk about Samson this morning. I am intrigued by the life of Samson. What an incredible brute. I mean, just a wild brute of a man. Um, in every way, is he? I mean, for instance, in a fit of anger, he takes a lion with his bare hands and, and tears it apart. Boy, you've got to be strong to do that. Uh, another time, he, get this, he lifted the city gates right off their hinges, right? And carried them uphill, up a mountain. He kind of, to me, he comes off as, have you ever seen the competition, the world's strongest man? And I mean, you got these guys, they're lifting up 500 pound rocks and setting them up on top of a pedestal. Samson must have been something like that. One time he tied 300 foxes together by their tails. Have any of you ever tied one fox to another fox? I've never even caught one fox. I've seen one zip past me. But he gets 300 of them and he ties them together by their tails and he sets them on fire and then turns them loose in the grain at the time of harvest. What, what a wild brute. One time he single-handedly whipped up on the Philistine army all by himself. I mean, so maybe he's, we should think of him like Cornell Walker. He can, he can beat an entire army by himself. Just think of how powerful that is. In fact, I love the way the new Jewish publication society translates the verse. It says that Samson gave them a very thorough thrashing. <laughs> I mean, he just thrashed them. Then, of course, he killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. And in the end, he killed at least 3,000 men and women as the pagan temple shook by his strength and fell, destroying the enemy. Judges, chapter 13 through 16, I'm not going to read all of that. That would be way too uh, way too cumbersome to read all of that text. But those four chapters, Judges 13, 14, 15, 16, you really ought to just read that this afternoon. 
And, and just to get a full picture of what Samson was like, like because he, he was just, I, it has to be, it has to be the most disturbing, the, the most uh, tumultuous reading in all of the scriptures. Four chapters of outrageous acts and feats by this strong man, Samson. He has the Spirit of God come upon him and, and he does amazing things. He's always testing the limit. He's always pushing to the edge of the envelope. For instance, he took honey out of the dead carcass of a lion. Well, he had been dedicated as a Nazarite. Nazarites are not supposed to touch dead carcasses. But Samson, you can just see him rationalizing, well, this isn't the dead body of a human, so it's okay, right? <laughs> and he always was hanging out at wild parties. Oh, he was carousing. We know that he visited prostitutes. He was in environments where they were partying. It does not say that he drank alcoholic beverages, but that happens a lot of times at parties. And Samson had taken a vow as a Nazarite, he would not drink any wine. So it doesn't say that he's drinking wine, but he sure is in the setting where they do a lot of drinking wine. And Samson was, was set apart as a Nazarite and one of the vows was that you never cut your hair. Okay, I'm going to risk telling an old, tired joke. If you've heard it, just laugh at the punchline. You, I'm sure you've heard about the teenager who said, Dad, you're always saying I have to get my hair cut and, and that I can't have long hair. I want to have long hair. Dad, Jesus had long hair. There's nothing wrong with long hair. And dad said, son, you're exactly right. You can have long hair. By the way, I want you to keep in mind, I'm so thrilled that you want to be like Jesus because next time you come and ask for the keys to the car, I will remind you that Jesus walked everywhere he went. <laughs> now that is an old, tired joke because I think Long hair has gone out of style, then come back in style, then gone out of style again while, I, while that joke's been circulating. <laughs> By the way, you know, the trendy look where I've seen a lot of pastors shave their head and I just love it. It looks so cool. I would do it if I could pull it off. It just would not look good on me. So, um, but, but think about Samson. He keeps giving these clues to his wife, Delilah about his strength. She wants to know the secret to his strength. He tells her, if you bind me up with bow strings, boy, that'll do it. I will be bound and I can't, I can't even function. I will lose all of my strength. So she ties him up with bow strings and boop, he just snapped so many laughs. laughs. He pulled another one over because he loved riddles. He was all the time trying to get people to figure out his riddles out of the eater something to eat, out of the beast something sweet. He's talking about the honey in the carcass of the lion. So next he tells her, oh, oh wait, I know what you did wrong. You have to have new ropes. If you have new ropes, then I will lose all my strength. Just a sidebar comment, in ancient times, ropes were made by using either the fiber from plants or animal hairs. So he's giving her, he's teasing her with this idea that somehow hair is involved in losing his strength. And he, he's becoming more risky. And so she binds him with new ropes, but he snaps them, poof, like nothing. And, and he, he just keeps going deeper and deeper. And he tells her, now, next, if you take the seven braids of my hair, and you tie them up and put a pin in them, then, then I'll lose my strength. But this time in the story, it, it tells us that he actually fell asleep. So 
there's a little bit of symbolism that's going along here. He keeps going a little more edgy, a little more risky. Yeah, just take the seven braids of my hair, tie them up, put a pin in them, and then, then I'll lose all of my strength. And this time, he falls asleep. And she does that. She ties his hair up in a knot, puts a pin in it. She yells out, the Philistines are coming. The Philistines are here. And Samson wakes up just like before. Boom, he snaps that pin out. And he comes out ready to fight. And he thinks he's in control as he keeps going closer and closer and closer to the edge. He keeps drifting. He keeps drifting a little closer to the edge, a little more risky, a little more risky. He doesn't know the trap is about to snap shut. Finally, she nagged and nagged and pestered and pestered and zapped the life right out of him. And Samson told her straight up, okay, my strength is in my hair. You shave my hair and I will lose all of my strength. Here's the answer to the riddle. You couldn't figure it out? Bam, there it is. Just shave my head. I'll lose my strength. He was so exhausted. He fell asleep. She gave him a buzz cut and she yells out, the Philistines! And there's a sad scenario when Samson falls asleep, his hair is cut off, and he shakes himself awake like before. And he thinks, I'll go out and defeat them just like I did before. But the scripture says that he did not know that the Lord had left him. How sad. How sad. You know, chances are that you can relate to Samson one way or another. Who knows? Maybe you are a brute just like Samson. You know that psychologists talk about the family of origin and the order of the pecking order and all of this stuff. You know how they say that the oldest son is always the daring, risky one out front and he's always uh, testing. And then the second one is, is always the peacemaker. The second one always makes peace, makes peace. The third one comes along, life of the party. Man, I mean, they got it all figured out. The only problem is, in my family, there were five of us. We didn't know where we belonged. I mean, we were just as confused as termites inside a yo-yo. But here's the thing about that. You probably can relate to Samson. One way or another. I mean, maybe you are the brute. Or... It could be that somebody's popping in your mind right now. It's that guy that always shows up and makes things tense. She, she's that loud, obnoxious one. She always says the wrong thing at the wrong time. It just makes everyone sit on the edge of their seat. There's a lot of mystery about Samson. A, a lot of mystery. The first thing that happens that's mysterious is his birth announcement. And, and right off the bat, we know something. Right off the bat, we know something. The first thing that happens, we know this. Here's what we know. There's some things that we don't know. I just want to speak about this word for a moment. Unknowable. 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 Um, there's this branch of psychology called metacognitive thought, and it means it means to think about the way we think. I've got. <laughs> I'm feeling really inspired this morning, you guys. This is not in the notes, but I just had this mental picture. If y'all ever saw. The old Andy Griffith TV show when Gomer Pyle joined the U.S. Marine Corps. And he's sitting in the barracks with a bucket on his head. And Andy says, Gomer, what are you doing under there? 
And he says, I'm just thinking about how easy it is to think under there. <laughs> Have you ever stopped to think about how you think? There is this mysterious figure in the birth story of, of Samson. Now, I tell you, before we do this, I wanted to read this, this old poem and see if you can follow along what they're saying because it kind of ties in with this. He that knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool. Shun him. He that knows not and knows that he knows not is a pupil. Teach him. He that knows and knows that he knows is asleep. Wake him. He that knows and knows that he knows is a teacher. Follow him. Now, in this whole idea about knowing and not knowing and, and unknowable, there is this mysterious figure in the birth story of Samson. He's simply called the angel of the Lord. He just simply shows up at Manoah's house and he tells his wife that she's going to give birth. But nobody knows him. The scripture just simply says he is the angel of the Lord. That is a fascinating study. If you ever have time to go through the Bible and look at all the references to the angel of the Lord, it's purely amazing. So he is the angel of the Lord, but sometimes in this story, it just simply calls him the Lord. So it's sort of back and forth, like we don't know if, if this is an angel or if at some point the Lord comes on the scene. Uh, maybe he's speaking through his representative. When Manoah, Samson's father, asked the Lord what his name was, he simply said, why do you ask? It is wonderful. Some people take that to, uh, to mean, well, this must have been a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ because Isaiah prophesied about Jesus Christ that he will be called wonderful. But um, I'm relying heavily upon on the new Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Let, me, let me take another stab at that. The new Jewish Publication Society um, is a translation of Scripture that, that takes into account some Jewish Hebrew nuances and it words it a different way. And, and it says this, you must not ask my name it is unknowable. That is to say, it, it is secret. It is, it is hidden. And so the logic goes then that, that this strength of Samson is a secret. It is unknowable. It, it is hidden to Manoah and his wife. It, it's hidden to his mom and dad. And Samson's strength, it was even a secret. It was unknowable. It was hidden from his own wife, Delilah. And the whole story centers around how do we find out what his strength is all about. And she keeps nagging him until he gave in. But what we learn from the story is the real secret of the strength that Samson has is not in his hair, but the strength comes from the fact that the Holy Spirit grips him. He thought it was his hair, but that was just a symbol. Because there's sometimes where Samson, when his hair is intact, he has great strength. But there's another time in the story where he prays for strength and God gives him water from a rock. And he drinks and his strength returns. And there's another time where he prays and says, God, even though I don't have hair, will you give me strength? And God honors his prayer. It's not his hair that gives him strength. It is the presence of the Lord. And now the Bible is just okay 
leaving this element of mystery in the story. When the angel of the Lord appeared and they gave a sacrifice to the Lord and the angel or the messenger, the Lord, the representative, whomever he may be, this mystery figure, he doesn't eat the food. But what does he do? He just sort of ascends in the smoke of the sacrifice and he's gone. I mean, that would freak me out. And what do uh, Manoah and his wife, what do they do? They respond just like you or I would do. Manoah says, we're going to die. We're going to die. We saw the Lord. But his wife is the one that makes sense. And all the ladies said, amen. <laughs> and, and she says, we're not going to die. Or else we would be dead already. He let us see him. We're going to be just fine. Plus, he has promised that I'm going to have a baby. And she did. Let me just tell you something. Many times as a follower of Jesus, you have to say, I don't have knowledge. You have to say, it is hidden from me. It's unknowable. There's secrets to God's ways. And I don't know everything. Sometimes he's mysterious. Sometimes I just trust him because he is so faithful. And so I just simply have to say, oh God, oh God, please touch me again with your mysterious power. Just keep me going. Sometimes I think it would be wonderful if we had all the answers. But then sometimes I think that may not be a good idea. I don't believe we could handle everything God is doing in our lives. So some things are unknowable, but then here's this point that I want to bring out to you. Gripped by mysterious strength. Notice the way that the Spirit of the Lord would work through Samson. Chapter 14, verse 6 says, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. Uh, verse 19 of chapter 14, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. Again, chapter 15, verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. But I am really touched by the way the New Jewish Publication Society words these verses. Every time there's these incredible display, di displays, in these incredible feats that Samson performs, Here's how New JPS says it. The Spirit of the Lord gripped him. The Spirit of the Lord gripped him. The Spirit of the Lord gripped him. It really captures something for me, this gripping of the Holy Spirit. So when Samson, he is toying and flirting with the idea of breaking his covenant, and so many times he came so close, but he still didn't divulge the secret of his power. And here's what Judges 16.9 says. It says, so the, strength, the secret of his strength remained unknown. So the secret of his strength remained unknown. I, when I read that, my mind races back to this visitor who came on the scene before his mother ever conceived and says to his parents, why do you ask my name? It's unknowable. And now, if I could even drive on this point further, I think this verse could be, so the secret of his strength remained. Unknown. Oh, let me say it another way. So the secret of his strength, who was unknowable, remained. Just when Samson thinks he knows, he really doesn't know. It's so sad 
that Delilah weakened Samson. Such sad words. Just a few verses later, she weakened him. His strength slipped away until that final indictment is written about him. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Yet, there's this glimmer of hope. Yet, there is this wonderful redemptive verse. Oh Lord God, please remember me and give me strength just this once. Oh God. It's a hint of true repentance. You could say it this way. Unknown re-enters. Unknown comes in undetected. Samson prays and the unknowable steps on the scene and says, yes, I will honor your prayer again. I will bless you. And his hair started to grow again, the scripture says. And in his last act, and great minds have wrestled with it through the ages. Was, was it a suicide? Was it an act of war? I guess I'll, I'll just have to leave that to far brighter minds than mine, but I, I do want to say this one thing. No man in his natural strength could do what Samson did in his death. No way. God honored his prayer. Lord, give me strength and let me die with the Philistines. I'm very comfortable to say this was an act of war. I don't, I don't like it. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not at ease with it. I mean, because it sort of feels kamikaze, doesn't it? I mean, doesn't it evoke memories of intentional death as an act of war to bring others down? But, but I'll leave you to wrestle with that. But here's the thing. Samson, he prays. And his, his last prayer is honored by God. And, and so Samson sacrifices his own life in an act of war that killed 3,000 plus Philistines with one blow. The Bible gives clear indicators that after Samson came back to his senses, he started understanding the way of the Holy Spirit how it worked in his life. He started recognizing the nuances of the moving of the Holy Spirit upon his life. It happened when the beast became the least. <sighs> he lost everything. The brute produced fruit. It, he lost his eyes. I mean, think about that. They... They plunged spears into his eyes. They gouged him and he lost his eyesight. This man that had been so strong, he lost everything. He lost every shred of dignity. In fact, the enemy is now making sport of him. Hey, bring Samson out here into the arena. Get him in the middle of the temple. Maybe he can do some strong acts for us. And they're belittling him and mocking him. But the beast is the least. The brute produced fruit. He calls out to the Lord from his desperation. I want to call on the name of the Lord with a brief prayer, with a sense of desperation for all of us right now gathered in the room. Would you pray with me? O oh, Holy Spirit of God, just when I think I know, I find out that I don't know. And yet, if I will admit it, if I will admit my ignorance of your unknowable state, you know you know, and I trust you. And I speak that over all of our church family right now. There are things that we, we just don't know. We don't get it. It's beyond us. It's mysterious. It's difficult at times, but we release to you. 
And I'm thankful for your words that you filtered through the apostle. Know fully, just as I am fully known. Father, right now, I know partially, and I'm fully known. But then, when everything is wide open and it's laid bare, we will know you fully, even as you fully know us. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, how often have you unknowingly gripped me? How grateful am I that you have gripped me? How very grateful, oh God. And I pray for each of us in this room. Please grip us. Grip us, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this story is not just about Samson. But it's a story about his family, his mother, his father. It's a story about his community. They were being attacked viciously by the Philistines. They were being tortured. And, and it happens in a time when God kept raising up heroes. Heroes like Deborah. Heroes like Jephthah. Heroes like Samson. To serve as judges, to serve as generals, to serve as leaders. I'd like to think that there's hope for an unruly brute like Samson. I'd like to think there's hope for an unruly brute like me. I'd like to think that there's hope for an unruly brute like you. There's an app for that. I'm going to close by giving you the top three applications that Samson gives us. And here's the first one. We don't always know the reasons why. You ought to just take your little cheat sheet out, your card, fill this in and reflect on it in some prayer time later this day. We don't always know the reasons why. Are you anything like me? I want to know why. I mean, I always want to know why. But sometimes we have to trust. You know, the name of the helper, the name of the deliverer, the bearer of good news, the messenger, was unknowable. Was too wonderful. You can't take it in. It, it doesn't always fit in our nice, neat little categories. Spirit-filled living sometimes can get messy. Second app. God grips me. Aren't you glad? Any good that ever comes out of our lives, you guys, it's because God has gripped us. You know what? Um, I believe that we have a choice in salvation. That's the way we practice it. That's the way we teach it that you get to choose whether you will be saved or not. One, one drawback is, one drawback is sometimes, sometimes, not always, sometimes because we believe this way, then sometimes people tend to kind of think, well, that means that I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I'm the captain of my fate. No, 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 no. We are saved only by God's grace. Him alone. He has gripped us. All we've done is just simply respond. Yes, Lord, thank you for gripping me. Amen. So God grips others too. He is sovereign. You know, I'm like, a, I'm like a scalpel in the hand of a surgeon. You're like a scalpel in the hand of a surgeon. Sometimes he will grip you and he will use you. Sometimes he will set you aside. It seems to me that he's more likely to use me if I've been thoroughly cleansed and sterilized. Has that been your experience too? Not always. Sometimes I'm really amazed that 
He uses me in spite of me. But it seems to me that when I present myself continually to Him and I'm praying that Psalm 51 cleansing, God, just wash me, just purify me, just let Your righteousness indwell me, that those are the times where just naturally it seems to flow. And He uses me. He grips me. But like I say, it's not always the case, and certainly it wasn't the case with Samson. <laughs> and then the third ad. It is never only about me. I laugh when I say this one because in, in worship practice this morning I was telling our sound crew, hey, I need more of me in the monitor. And then I thought, oh no, I don't want to be that person. So, you know, the, by the way, there's a joke of, of, about singers. How many altos does it take to change a light bulb? Six. One, to sing the note, and the other five to say, it's too high, it's too high. <laughs> I just couldn't resist. That's kind of mean, but... <laughs> it's never only about me. It, it's, it never is. When God does things in our lives, it's not about me. And I, I think we tend to sometimes think, why is everything happening to me? Why is everybody always picking on me? The Bible actually says that your brothers and sisters all over the face of the earth all face the same temptations. We all face the same battles. When I find myself in a difficult stretch, what I really need to do is step back and say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me through this? And also, what are we as a community learning as we go through this together? I want our worship band to come back up here. I've asked Nick to uh, to play the guitar and sing that last song uh, one more time about the love of God. And I just want us to just simply be worshipers. I want you to stand to your feet and, and we're going to sing and worship. and guards his flock from Satan's snares. A pastor's heart is attentive and seeks to know that his people cares. A pastor's heart is sacrificial and for his sheep will give us all. A pastor's heart is tender and listens to the Spirit's call. A pastor's heart is obedient and heeds the Master's commands. A pastor's heart is reflective and considers he is but a man. Amen. 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 Many are called, but few are chosen. Amen. Amen. We are so blessed to have Pastor and Stephanie as our shepherds. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to ask God to bless them and keep them. Before you leave this morning, there is a cupcake for everybody in honor of them. So say thank you. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray over them. Stretch out your hands. And let's pray in the name of Jesus, oh God. We thank you, Lord, for our pastors, Lord. For their heart, their giving heart, their loving heart. Lord, for their open minds and their open hearts, God. We thank you, God, that they pray and they get on their knees before you on a daily basis and they seek your word and they seek your will in their lives and in their church body, Lord. We thank you, God, that when there is a need, they go to be the call. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've given them. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God, for giving them to us, God, and having them as our shepherds, Lord. We honor them and we appreciate them and we love them, God. Guard them, guide them, and keep them, Lord. Keep Stephanie and Pastor and Nick and Zach safe, God. Send your angels to encamp around about them, Lord, and protect them, Father. Lord, we ask for many, many more years of service with them, Lord. It's been an honor, God, to serve for them and with them, Lord. As we go on in the next few years, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your call upon their lives, God. We are honored, Lord. 
And we are proud, Lord, to have them as our shepherds. In the name of Jesus, we bless them. In Jesus' name, we pray.